Hi, my name is Ben Worf. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon here at Children's Hospital where I'm the director of neonatal and congenital anomalies neurosurgery. I'm here to talk to you today about hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a common condition. In fact, it's the most common condition that we treat in pediatric neurosurgery. This is a normal brain. Inside the brain are these spaces that we call ventricles. Inside the ventricles is a tissue called choroid plexus that pumps out cerebrospinal fluid. It's like water that has a little sugar and salt in it, you might say. The brain makes about one ounce of this every hour. And at the same rate it's being produced, it makes its way out of the brain and to the outside fluid space where it is absorbed at the same rate that it's being produced. Hydrocephalus occurs when anything interferes with that. So, um, if there's an obstruction to the flow of this fluid, or if it's able to get out but is not being efficiently absorbed in the linings around the brain, then fluid backs up in the spaces in the brain because it's continuing to be produced. What happens then is that these spaces get larger. And that large space with this buildup of fluid is the condition we call hydrocephalus. Now hydrocephalus is a real problem because as that fluid builds up it puts pressure on the brain and this can affect the developing brain in a young child and it can eventually lead to uh, a dangerous illness where the child becomes quite ill, ultimately would go into coma and potentially die, or in a young infant, the head grows very fast, much faster than normal, and the child gets a large head and their development is affected adversely because of this buildup of pressure inside the brain. Hydrocephalus can be caused by a number of different things, such as a tumor blocking the fluid, a hemorrhage inside the brain, or an infection, and there are also congenital causes of hydrocephalus where these fluid pathways are not formed properly and therefore the fluid does not get out of the brain efficiently. Whatever the cause of hydrocephalus, it's very important to treat it, especially in a young child so that we can protect their brain and allow them to otherwise develop as well as they could normally. Once your child is diagnosed with hydrocephalus, it's important to move along with treatment. And the most common way to treat hydrocephalus is the placement of a device called a shunt. A shunt is a tube that goes through a small opening in the skull, passes through the brain, and enters into this enlarged ventricle. This is attached to a small valve which regulates the flow of fluid, and then tubing slides underneath the skin and is passed into the abdominal cavity where the fluid can be absorbed in a normal way. We put extra tubing into the belly so the child doesn't outgrow it as they get taller. So as the fluid is blocked in here in the ventricle, it can now uh, have a way to escape and get out of the brain by flowing down into the belly. The problem with shunts is that they can require a number of operations sometimes throughout the child's life to keep them functioning properly. And being dependent on a device that requires maintenance can be a real problem. There's another alternative treatment which might be appropriate for your child, but not in every case. That alternative is called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or ETV. In this procedure, an endoscope is passed through a small opening in the skull into the ventricle of the brain. This is attached to a camera so that we can see inside and perform the procedure. A small opening is made in a membrane at the base of the ventricle spaces that allows the fluid to escape into the normal fluid pathway and be absorbed. And this bypasses the obstruction that has caused the hydrocephalus in the first place. For certain patients, this is a cure for the hydrocephalus, 
and failures later on in life are very rare. Usually, if this is not going to work, it becomes apparent fairly soon after the operation. For young infants, we've known that endoscopic third ventriculostomy does not have as high a rate of success. Here at Children's, we're trying to push the envelope on avoiding shunt dependence in young children. And we found that if at the time we performed the ETV, we reduce this tissue that's making the fluid by a procedure called a choroid plexus cauterization, or CPC, it significantly increases the likelihood that the ETV is going to be successful in babies. And so, for young infants, sometimes we do the combined procedure that we call an ETV CPC. It's our hope here at Children's Hospital Boston that this innovative procedure we've developed will be able to avoid shunt dependence in many children in the years to come.